Can you hear me? Hello. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Thomas. Um, this morning is morning prayer, um, officiated by Jennifer, who we are unfortunately, as a parish, um, saying goodbye to this morning. Jennifer will be starting a new position as um, priest in charge of St. James's Church in Louisa, starting September 1st, and she will be ordained to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church on September 12th. And so, as a parish, we are sad to see her go. As a uh, colleague, I am happy for her, and I know that I'm not saying goodbye by any means. Um, we will see each other, she and I will see each other often and regularly as, um, as priests in the diocese. But um, um, I am proud of her, and um, I'm delighted that she's getting ready to be ordained, and yay for the church um, for that. Um, as usual, um, our here we are, um, the, the, uh, the mask if you need them, hand sanitizer are on the uh, table. Um, if you need to go into the bathroom, just go in through the church, use the bathroom that's uh, in the hallway, and then come out through the door where the um, where the uh, where the fountain, where the chimes are, where the where the uh, control thing for the chimes are. It's just the door that's in that hallway, and that will lead you right back outside here. Um, I don't think that there's anything else. Welcome, it's great to see you all, and um, all those of you online, it's great to see you, and um, we'll start with the prelude. Thanks for being here this morning. And peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Send out your light and your truth that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. 
for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Give you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Amen. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the height of the hills is his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. is taken from the book of Exodus. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters, taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and every kind of field labor. 
They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let the girls live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. When she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, who took him as her son. She named him Moses. Because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Here ends the reading. second lesson is from Paul's letter to the Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your body. 
bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation. The giver in generosity. The leader in diligence the compassionate in cheerfulness. Here ends the reading.
third lesson for today is from the book of Matthew 16, 13 through 20. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he said to his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Here ends the reading. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Today is a bittersweet day. I'm going to try to get through this sermon without crying. I may or may not be successful. It's a day that I'm saying goodbye to St. Thomas as I anticipate saying hello and embracing new life and new ministry at St. James Louisa. It's bittersweet because while I'm eager to begin the next step in my journey, I'm sad to say goodbye and to say goodbye in such a strange way during this pandemic to St. Thomas's, a congregation I have grown to love. I'm leaving 12 years of ministry at Bon Secours as a chaplain and moving into a new phase of ministry as priest. Chaplain and priest share many things in common, but there are some distinctions in the calling in ministry. I will grieve leaving the chaplaincy, a calling that I love, meeting people that I would never meet in my everyday life, those that will never enter the building of an Episcopal church. But without me leaving Bon Secours, I wouldn't be able to step into St. James and what God has for me there. Our gospel text this morning is a good one for this day, as it comes at the midpoint in Jesus' ministry. I will be 50 next year, my kids say that I keep saying I've been 50 for the past three years, and my body and spirit feel like that. But I'm going to be 50 <laughs> next year. And this transition may be coming at the midpoint of my ministry. What are these birds? <laughs> What's happening? Did y'all hear me? <laughs> Jesus had chosen 12 students' disciples to follow him and learn his way of life. They were a part of a role model mentor program. They followed Jesus, observed his life, listened to his teachings, and worked to incorporate what they saw and what they heard into their lives. Jesus' questions were often asked to stimulate their thinking. Rather than simple right or wrong, yay or nay kinds of questions, Jesus asked questions that revealed their thinking, their unspoken assumptions about life. His questions challenged them to think. His disciples didn't always like or understand his questions. In Luke 13, there's a story of when the news came that Pilate had killed a number of Galileans and had mixed their blood with that of their sacrifices. There was an unspoken assumption, and it seems that there may be those that were present who thought that maybe they deserved it or something. Jesus asked his disciples, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than any others that this could happen to them? The unspoken question is, do you think that people who experience tragedy are any worse than other people? We still ask this question. We word it a little different, but we still ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Jesus didn't answer their question or air question directly. There is no easy answer to these difficult questions. 
None of us are immune from the kinds of tragedy and heartache that are a part of our world. His stories sometimes left his disciples troubled and baffled. He would tell a parable to the crowd, and as soon as they were alone, the disciples would ask, what in the world were you talking about? Explain it to us. When you were talking about the wheat in the field, were we the weeds or the wheat? Jesus was halfway through his time and his disciples in today's text. As I read the Gospels, it doesn't appear that Jesus set out with a curriculum that prescribed what Jesus planned on teaching his disciples. Instead, Jesus dealt with whatever situation presented itself and tried to instill the basic principles of his teachings to his students. Jesus could use the lilies of the valley, the sheep on the hillside, or the simple request of a stranger as a teachable moment. Jesus used the simple, concrete events that happened along the way as opportunities for demonstrating his values and way of life. It may be that this is the way that we all learn best. It is certainly the way that we raise our children. We don't just sit down and tell them. We experience an event, we act, we speak, and they ask, why did you do that? Or they don't ask, but they absorb. It's these unexpected moments, moments that I tend to think of as moments of grace, where we sometimes learn and grow the most. We have moments where we see if our children and those around us have picked up what we've taught. I dropped one daughter off at college on Thursday and another goes back today. It's not necessarily my midpoint with them, but it is a time when I will see what it is that they have learned, what they're going to embrace things or not, the things that I've instilled in them. The gospel lesson today comes at the midpoint of Jesus' ministry, and it's a time of evaluation. Jesus wants to know where they are. What have they really learned? So he asked some questions. Who do people say that I am? What are other people saying about me? What is the word on the street? The disciples are quick to report answers. Some are suggesting that Jesus is John the Baptist raised from the dead. Some people saw the connection between Jesus' teaching and that of Jeremiah. Some people could hear the fervor and intensity of Elijah when Jesus spoke. Some people thought that Jesus was a prophet. Their answers indicate that they had been paying attention. They knew what people were saying. They were perceptive and observant of their environment. They could all report what they were hearing, and they could tell you what people were saying. Life and faith would be much simpler if we only had to report on other people's opinions. Much what we see on Facebook and other social media platforms are things that people are forwarding that other people have said. Other quotes or thoughts that people thought were worth sharing because they agreed with it in some way or another. Occasionally, someone will post something and instead of saying, I agree with this, they just say, what do you think? They don't take a position. I suspect that they want to see if it's a popular idea to hold to this position and they're testing the waters with their post to see what kind of reaction they'll get. I much prefer the post from people who just stand and by that I mean they just take a position. Whether you agree or disagree, you know where this person stands. So today, Jesus is questioned to Peter and he asked him to take a stand. Inevitably, life is more about other people's opinions. Life and faith always move to the next part of the exam. What about you? What do you believe? The disciples grow quiet. Now Jesus was calling for their personal response. What do you believe? Who do you say that I am? That question has a way of quieting any crowd. Soren Kierkegaard described faith as a leap. While we may walk around faith, kick the tires, put our toe in the water, ultimately faith is a leap. 
Faith is jumping in, head first, naming and claiming faith as your own. No one spoke. They were silent until Peter spoke up. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Simon, son of Jonah, you are a blessed man. On this rock, I will build my community. This confession is the foundation of much of church history, and specifically the Roman Catholic Church tradition. It's through this statement that Catholic tradition views Peter as the first pope. This power bestowed upon him by Christ himself, giving Peter power, position, and authority. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. These words are viewed as the basis of the priest's ability to forgive sins through the sacrament of confession. People who belong to other Christian denominations do not believe in the sacrament of confession or the need to go to a priest to be absolved from your sins, but to many, specifically Catholics, this verse in scripture states that priests have been given this authority. We, as Episcopalians, have a sacramental right, reconciliation of the penitent, that serves as an outward sign of our participation in and experience of God's reconciliation and healing. Episcopals recognize that we are going to fail in our desires and the promises we make to God, and when we inevitably fail or flounder in this life, we see the necessity to take action to repent and return to the Lord. The reconciliation of the penitent is a sacramental rite whereby we seek and receive that forgiveness. People are sometimes surprised to learn that the Episcopal Church has a service for confession, thinking that it's only for Catholics. Some say we confess in church every Sunday, which we do. So they say, I'm covered. The Episcopal Church's approach to the rite of reconciliation of penitent is that all can, some should, none must. No one must partake in the sacrament, but it is a way for us to take the time to work through those things for which we're seeking forgiveness and to be reconciled with God in a thoughtful and deliberate manner. In order to do this, you need a confessor to offer the right, normally a priest or a bishop, because they are empowered by the church to offer absolution, to declare on behalf of God that a person's sins are forgiven. Peter, in this one moment, moved to the heart of the faith in Christ. He moved beyond discussing what other people think and say to naming his own profession of faith. He moved to his faith. My ordination to the priesthood in a few short weeks in many ways will remember, resemble this. While I have owned my faith since I was a small girl, I will be moving into and answering the question Christ has asked me. Jennifer, who do you say I am? And how will you serve me? I'll be answering that question. Peter knew that Jesus was the Messiah but he wasn't clear what that meant. He couldn't imagine that the Messiah would be rejected. How could Messiah not succeed in liberating the homeland from Roman occupation? Sometimes the exam shows us how much we know and sometimes we realize how much we still need to learn. Like Peter, we may get the answer right, but still spend the rest of our lives working on understanding why the answer is right. Jesus is the Christ. We affirm that truth. I am committing myself to spending the rest of my life affirming this truth. At my ordination in a few weeks, the bishop will ask me, do you believe that you are truly called by God and his church to this priesthood? And I will say yes. I'm pretty sure that I don't yet understand all of what this will mean but I am committing myself to this trust and responsibility. In the last part of the examination from the bishop, she will say, may the Lord who has given you the will to do these things give you the grace and power to perform them. I will respond, amen. And I say amen today. 
I want to close today by thanking you all. When I was placed at St. Thomas, I had no idea where the journey would take us. I came to meet Herbert, didn't know what it would be like, didn't know what to expect, and I was so pleasantly surprised. We hear that God gives us those things we need, even when we don't know that we need them. I knew I needed you, a place to love and to learn. I had no idea how much I would fall in love with all of you and how perfect you would be for me. I am eternally grateful for Herbert. He was a perfect fit for me. Jimmy and Abby and Katie, you have a wonderful staff. I couldn't ask for a better group of friends, and thank you for coming out today. Each of you, and I'm tempted to list you by name, have been part of my journey and have loved me and supported me in so many ways. You have been an extension of God's grace. You're a special congregation, and I've been privileged to have been part of you for the past two years. I'm going to miss you all tremendously. I'll be around. Please reach out to me and include me in things. We need our family. May God continue to give you the grace and power to do the things Christ has called you to. Until we meet again, Godspeed. Amen. Please join me as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, 
and bring us to be of one heart and mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, and all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of our any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity and in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of our holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You're welcome to say your intercessions either aloud or silent. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of this world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you in the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.